don't know if you can see my my dog, but uh, if you like, you know, tell me what kind of pets you have in the chat so I know that everybody can see and that this is working and that we're ready. Or or feel free to tell me about um, where you're going for July 4th, <laughs> if you're going anywhere. Yeah, looks like. Yes. Oh, yes. Trisha knows it's Leo. All right. I'm assuming a uh, standard poodle. All right. Thanks, Marcia. Nice to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, just um, and I'll mention this during the, the event, but you'll be able to um, communicate. <laughs> I won't be able to answer all the questions till the end, but, you know, I have Trisha on here, who's my helper. So if you have questions and such, just use the chat. But uh, hi, Jeanette. Yes, you're, you've got two dogs, one American Pit and a Pit Cane Corso. No, I'm not sure I've ever seen that. Yeah. Riley, I like that name. Yeah, every weekend in Naples is a staycation. Yes, I, I've heard all about that. Hi, Laura. It's good to have you here. I haven't seen you in a long time. Hope you're well. Glad to have you joining. Let's see, a large be a beagle, Lucy. That's nice. So in case anybody doesn't know about me, and we got three minutes before everybody else gets here, but um, not only do I have now one dog and soon to be two, also two cats and a visiting cat because my daughter is home from college and two horses, but we also um, foster uh, these um, um, uh, dogs and cats that would otherwise be uh, euthanized. So um, that's kind of my, my wife's thing, but it's my thing. Anyway, it's, uh, it's a busy house here. We have so many uh, animals flying in and out of here and we're like the community, uh, people are always donating stuff and leaving it on our front porch for us to take to the center. So anyway, in case you were wondering if I was an animal person, I am. <laughs> so uh, yes, so someone here says, I, oh, you're so busy with plan giving prospects in your area for the Salvation Army. Oh, right. So you're a customer. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Sandra. Nice to have you. Or Peggy. Oh, and Peggy. Okay, got it. All right. So look, in about two minutes, thanks for people are rolling in still. Um, I get it. Got it. Hi, Peggy. <laughs> oh, look, Sandra must know Peggy. Uh, so yeah, we'll get started at just a, 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 a bit past the top of the hour. So feel free, we were kind of chit chatting and people are uh, using the chat while we're waiting to tell about uh, our favorite pets and their names or where we're going um, if we're doing anything for the July 4th weekend. So um, hopefully, you know, gas prices aren't, aren't taking a hit on your travels, but yeah. So feel free to use the chat tool, to tell us about your favorite pet and such. And we're going to get started in just about a mm, little bit more than a minute. All right. I see a lot of familiar names here. So it looks like a lot of friends. So if this is a terrible presentation, I guess I won't lose too much. Uh, but I, th I think you're going to get a lot out of this. So I'm very excited about it. And we'll get started in maybe just another minute. And hopefully my dog stays asleep behind me. Be helpful. I walked him like crazy. So we'll see how that works. All right. And many of you know that uh, we set up three different times for this event because I figured a lot of people would be traveling. So maybe this one will be a smaller group and we'll have more engagement, I don't know. Sometimes we have hundreds, sometimes it's fewer. And with that said, I'm gonna get the ball rolling here. All right, gonna pull up my slides. Whew. All right, well, welcome everybody. 
Thank you for joining me today. We're going to talk about breaking down silos so that you can build a more functional organization that raises more money. Thanks for joining me. Some quick, super quick housekeeping. Um, this is being recorded. The slides will be sent to all the registrants and attendees, of course. Uh, questions will be answered at the very end. Throughout this uh, presentation, you can use the chat tool. My friend Tricia is here to help out. There she is. Hi, Tricia. <laughs> and um, yeah, you can use the chat tool, raise your hand or ask questions, but just please know that I won't be answering questions until the very end. Um, Market Smart, like if you're interested in Market Smart at all, feel free to reach out to us. We'll talk to you, we'll provide a demo. Uh, it's only informative and educational. We don't have like high pressure salespeople or anything like that. So uh, I encourage you to do that. Our website's imarketsmart.com. And uh, I am the founder and CEO of Market Smart. You can find me on LinkedIn and I'm fairly active, uh, not as active as I used to be, but I love to get connected with people. I'm happy to be connected. So feel free to reach out to me if you'd like. Then you'll get in my stream and you'll see lots of goodies and uh, insights and uh, things like that. I'm also the author, uh, author of engagement fundraising, which is a term I, I came up with when uh, I fell into this space because essentially I was just a marketing guy running a marketing agency for private sector businesses and got mad at my favorite charity and came up with a, a way for them to raise money from major donors and legacy donors. And uh, it worked so well that we got referred around and I just cut off the uh, marketing that I was doing for the private sector. And now we're just full steam ahead with nonprofits. So the, the strategy, the ideas, everything that we do that people pay for, you can also learn about them and do them for free using uh, what I wrote in that book. I also, uh, because I'm investing every penny I have almost all the time in my business, I, uh, I, although I still try to be philanthropic, financially speaking, uh, I do build technology and just give it away to the sector. It's my way of being philanthropic. So some of you may know the fundraising report card I invented, which is a data visualizer, and it's 100% free. It's very simple to use. It doesn't require integrations or anything like that, but it'll show you your metrics and you could even see how you compare to others. We're gonna talk about some data in a minute. Uh, I also invented the DAF widget, which helps move money from DAF accounts into your organization's bank account. So if you're interested in that, you go to dafwidget.com. Again, these links will be in the slides that you'll get. And I also helped create the Donor Story Epic Fundraising eCourse with Dr. Russell James based on his research. Um, so quick thing about Market Smart, in case you don't know us, we are your outsourced, done for you major gift marketing team. Most mar major gift te uh, uh, teams internal, internal in your organization, you don't have the kind of support that you really need for major gift marketing, lead generation, cultivation, qualification, and prioritization to help build um, um, caseloads and portfolios, if you will. So we are that outsource group. We do it, it's turnkey, turn it on and it works. Uh, it helps you land more meetings with major donor prospects when they're ready to talk um, about giving assets, frankly, or legacy gifts. It comes with a 10 to one return on investment offer. So, I mean, excuse me, we've never had to uh, give anybody money back, thankfully, because it always works, but it is guaranteed that you'll get at least 10 to one on your return or your money back. So um, that takes the risk out of it. All of this is designed to help you be the fundraiser that you always wanted to be. And that's our goal. So let's move on into this presentation. We're gonna talk about breaking down silos. This uh, is mostly based on research conducted by Dr. Russell James, who many of you may already know. He is the foremost researcher in the field 
world-class educator. He's published in, been published in 75 peer-reviewed journals. He's been on every major media station and interviewed in all kinds of newspapers. He uh, most recently was inducted into the Hall of Fame for the National Association of Charitable Gift Planners. He also has a PhD in consumer economics, was a former director of planned giving, also was a former president of a college where he completed two capital campaigns, built several debt-free buildings and tripled enrollment. So I guess I would say that this guy knows what he's talking about. And that's why I based this presentation mostly on what he's saying. However, you should know that as a private sector CEO, I also base some of my, my understanding of this on certain books that I've read. If you're in leadership and you wanna learn um, how to build a functional operation that'll really gain traction, this may not be for uh, your staff, but this book, Traction, is unreal and I recommend it. And there are a lot of nonprofit leaders that, that have read it and are taking on the principles presented in it by Gino Wickman. Highly, highly, highly recommend it for leadership. Now for every single person in your organization, and we, we've had every single person in mind read five dysfunctions of a team and sometimes read it two or three times. This uh, is a highly recommended book because this is gonna be about 30 minutes of, of my understanding based on Dr. James and based on this, of, of how to build a functional team. Uh, this book is, is, is what um, uh, led me in this direction. So, uh, and not to brag, but we are uh, pretty highly regarded by past, it's, I guess it's mostly past um, employees on Glassdoor, they write really nice things. There's one or two that I don't think are really true, but, um, and that dings up our score, but it's almost perfect score. So I guess I'm gonna say that I think I know what I'm talking about in this regard. But again, this presentation is mostly based on uh, Dr. James's research. So with that, uh, what you're gonna learn today is we're gonna, we're gonna break down this problem we're gonna uh, emphasize why the problem needs to be fixed and how to, then we'll get into how to fix it, okay? It's gonna be a lightning round, really. We're gonna cover a lot very quick. Also, many of you took a survey, more of an assessment, uh, maybe a couple of days ago, we sent out an email and said, hey, take this seven questions really quick. I'll be presenting that mostly at the very end, but I'll give you a teaser right here because one of the questions was, well, it wasn't really a question, but it was asking you to rank all the teams and saying, uh, how, how, how true is it that all teams work together to make sure fundraisers are not discredited or treated as others and rather are supported, heard, and collaborated with in relation to donor needs and the provision of value by the entire organization to the donor, right? So uh, what's interesting, and this is just a teaser, I'll go, I'll go over the other ones when at the end of the presentation, but it, I, I was a little disappointed, but maybe, maybe this should be expected. Uh, I would have hoped that it, we didn't see so many that said it's not very true or definitely not true. But um, look, this isn't a scientific survey or anything. This was just a fun assessment that I, I thought I'd take to see. Um, but it, it could be better, but it's not as bad as I thought. All right. So let's get to the first uh, point that I said I'd address out of three, which is why do these silos exist in organizations? You know, it's like a, it's a head scratcher. I mean, we know they exist, but like what, what is causing this? And so I thought about it and looked at Dr. James' research and tried to come to some of my own conclusions. And I decided that this is what I call a flying golf ball uh, conversation. This is a, this is a, flying golf ball problem. So I'm terrible at golf, but, uh, and maybe you don't even play golf, but you can understand the idea of flying golf balls coming at you. They're really hard to hit when they're flying, but when you set them down, it's a lot easier to understand them, to see them, to, to get a grip on your, 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 and then swing and knock them. You know, so it's a lot harder when they're flying at you. So I break down this problem really into three, really four in a second, I'll show you, but it's, um, it breaks down into the fact that there's 
there's money is involved. There are relationships involved and there are different needs of different individuals involved. When you have money relationships and needs involved in anything, whether it's your, uh, your local church, your, your, you know, your family <laughs> or your organization, there is going to be potential for dysfunction, right? Dysfunction is, is we all have years that operate in our organizations or in our families and our friendships, but, um, uh, the gears can either run smoothly or run poorly. And what you need for functionality is you need a little bit of oil to grease them and keep them running smoothly. So um, having those three golf balls, uh, the fourth one that, that, that we want to add to it to make everything better is, is the functionality. So I'm going to go through the first three and uh, kind of lay out some details about each of these golf balls and hopefully it makes sense and you agree. There could be more golf balls. Feel free to add those in the chat if you feel, but um, uh, this is the way I see it and uh, we'll see what you think. So first we've got money, right? Money, <laughs> money changes behavior. It makes people act in, in interesting ways. Most organizations are set up in such a way where you have different departments, you have departments that are focused on raising low dollar gifts, mostly from cash, and you have departments that are focused on raising big dollars from mostly from assets. These are two very different mindsets and different types of staff. And most of the budget, in fact, usually, because it's spent on um, things like postage or TV commercials, printing, you know, is going to be um, spent on uh, the lower dollar fundraising. Okay. Now, low dollar um, fundraising compared to high dollar fundraising, uh, well, it comes out to show some, there's uh, humongous differences, which you know inherently, but I'm gonna show you information from the fundraising report card that really starts to make this seem quite contrasting. Um, the under $100 donors compared to the over $5,000 donors, which is what we broke. I, I wasn't really looking at mid-level donors. We could always get into that, but let's just try and keep it. This is complicated enough, but the average donation from an under $100 donor is just 25 bucks as of last year. That was the end of last year's numbers. But for over $5,000 donors, it's 41, almost $41,000. The retention rate for the low dollar donors is just now 16%. It keeps going down. It used to be upwards of 20, 22%. It just keeps going down for these low dollar donors, but for the over $5,000 donors, it just keeps going up. So it's more than double the retention rate. And the lifetime value of low dollar donors is just uh, terrible. I mean, the return is, is not very good, only 45 bucks compared to $75,000, which doesn't even include the legacy gifts and the legacy gifts of the over $5,000 donors tend to be much, much greater than the low dollar donors. Not discounting the low dollar donors, just saying that like, look at, look at what, what different departments are seeing and how different departments need to behave. This is, um, this is just fascinating to me. It's always fascinating. And there's also this fact that the low dollar donors, the quantity of them seems to be disappearing while the over $5,000 uh, donors, there aren't more of them, but they are giving more. So I was at a college in Kansas yesterday that called it donors down, dollars up which I, I keep hearing other people using that. Now, what is happening is there's this aberration. It used to be uh, the 80-20 rule that 20% of your revenue, I'm sorry, 20% of your donors would supply 80% of your revenue, but now it's more like 76% of your revenue comes from less than 1%, just 0.74% or it's, uh, yeah, of your donors, less than 1%. So the way this breaks down is donors giving over $5,000, those are usually asset gifts, 
from assets, I should say. It's less than 1% of your donor base, but it makes up 76% or almost three quarters of your revenue. Now this is on average from the 10,000 plus organizations that have input their data into the free fundraising report card I developed. Uh, yours might be different. You could always uh, input the data or reach out to us and we'll help you, it's free again, but we'll help you see where what, what your 80-20 is. Uh, the donor is giving under a hundred bucks, mostly from cash or checks, credit cards. They make up 77% of your donors, but it's only about 5% of all of your revenue. The rest comes from the mid-level donors, of course. But the marketing, uh, uh, so to speak, or the fundraising cost or the ROI, I should say, is, is really exponential in when you focus on the over $5,000 donors compared to what you get when you uh, work on generating money from low dollar donors. So that, by the way, just in, in there is like, okay, you got different departments working on different kinds of donors. There's, that's going to create friction. That kind of money aberrate that 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 is going to create friction okay now according to dr james's research uh which he just got from the census is where is wealth stored so most wealth is not stored in cash or checks or money market deposits that's not where people hold wealth people hold wealth in stocks and bonds and retirement accounts and such so what, what this means, though, is that while we may look at a dollar and say, well, a dollar is a dollar, I mean, a, the value of a dollar doesn't change, no matter who you get the dollar from, it doesn't change. But it does matter because when you're asking for a dollar from someone who thinks mostly about cash giving, or, or if you're asking for a dollar from a cash account, a credit card, a check, it's kind of like more painful, if you will, because it's coming from a smaller bucket. But a dollar coming from someone's assets feels like it's less costly to give. So uh, that plays a part in this as well. The, there's also misunderstandings among some staff or organizational leaders about wealthy people and the number of like dynastic wealthy people and philanthropic people in America is, is kind of declining. And there's a new wealthy, many are immigrants, first generation wealthy people. They're very different than the dynastic kinds of wealthy people. And they actually don't feel secure it doesn't matter that they have $50 million, but according to Dr. James' research, wealthy people with 50 million or more actually, one out of five, feel extremely financially secure. Well, uh, that's, that's not a lot. I mean, only one out of five? And one out of 10 say that they feel somewhat insecure. And you think to yourself, how can that be? I mean, $50 million. But it just is the way it is. And um, there's reason for that. And this kind of plays into, into um, we'll, what we'll talk about later, because if the organization doesn't understand, and there's many other uh, psychographics that we could talk about, but I pulled this one out, because if we don't understand how people with wealth and with assets think and, and how they feel, um, then and I mean across the organization, not just in the major gifts department, then we're going to have some friction when it comes to um, assigning metrics for accountabilities and such. You can't just call up Oprah, in other words, and, and, and solicit her, right? Also, wealthy people, for the most part, actually, and, and this is more so for the first generation wealthy, they don't know how to give their money away. We would think, well, they're super smart. They built this business or they did this, they did that. So they must know, but they don't know. They don't know how to give money away. They spent most of their lives. It's not like the dynasty people who they were taught from the time they were children how to be philanthropic because their parents were philanthropic. That's not it for the first generation wealthy. They just don't know. They spent most of their working lives 
figuring out how to accumulate wealth. They don't know how to give it away. And they're even more dependent on the major gift and legacy gift fundraiser to support them in their decision-making process. And they want that support. They want that help. Okay, because their financial advisors are often not incentivized to help them give it away. So let's break down this money category, like way deep, maybe more detailed than you really need. But this is when you start to break this down, you see how different departments who are focused on different types of giving can um, see things from very different lenses. And then that creates friction and conflict which creates silos. So um, the cash side, like the solicitation level of difficulty is really quite easy. And it's, it's, it's a simple, it's not complex. It's like, okay, send a letter, <laughs> send a solicitation letter. That's not hard, but asking for assets, if you're going to ask for a $5 million donation, that's different. That's a sophisticated sale, if you will it's gonna require different kinds of organizational planning for, for uh, gathering assets. It's more strategic. In fact, uh, some experts say that 80% of a major gift officer's time should actually be spent thinking and developing strategy, which is mind blowing to someone in maybe a more uh, low dollar oriented part of the business where they're thinking more tactical, you know, how do we get the mailing out? Uh-oh, there's not enough envelopes, you know, things like that. That's very tactical. And the uh, predominant focus that we see in the cash solicitation is more about what the organization needs. And maybe even now we're turning towards what society needs, you know, be good uh, steward of society. But when you're talking about asset giving, you've got to focus on donor needs because donors won't give unless their needs are addressed. They just won't give uh, assets without that exchange of value. So the communication approach for the lower dollar gifts is more one way and, and commercial, if you will. It's arm's length. And the, uh, the way you have to communicate for assets is more bilateral. It's much messier, if you will, and more reciprocal. <clears throat> There's more give and take. You don't need to have as much trust in an organization to give a low dollar gift. And uh, well, it compared to if, if someone's giving assets, their trust must be exponentially higher. And um, in terms of the time focus that the organization will commit to, it's generally, the, and they get addicted to this, is this near-term immediate gratification to keep cash rolling in, even if it only makes up a smaller portion of the entire budget. But the, the organization as a whole has to be comfortable with delayed gratification and long-term results when they, there's a focus on assets. This just creates more friction and conflict because you've got two different machines running. One is, is just chomping and, and bringing in money every day. And the other one, it's kind of fits and starts. It seems like nothing's happening. And then all of a sudden, boom, $5 million drops, right? So the type of staff that you need is going to be very different for the cash giving. It's going to be more marketers and communicators, for those commercial kind of one-way messages compared to the relationship builders, counselors, and advisors that the donors seek for giving assets. Now, the cost, uh, some of you may, may, may uh, disagree, but I have found that the, the cost of the staff is lower on an individual basis. Maybe you spend more money because there are more staff focused on events and cash and such, but um, the individuals tend to be more highly paid uh, if they are working on asset gifts. Now, the addressable market, which is actually very important, is something to know is that the, um, the addressable market uh, for cash donors is large. I mean, it's hundreds of millions of people, and it is growing while the number of people who can make asset gifts is small and somewhat shrinking, all right? The um, revenue potential though, 
for cash giving is much higher for assets, as we talked about before. And the revenue potential is growing while the revenue potential for cash gifts is just been, is declining, which I'll show you a, 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 a metric on that. In a, oh, and there's the last one is the return on investment, which we talked about earlier. So that's, that's as far as I'm gonna go with money. Next, I'm gonna break down, I'm gonna talk about relationships. We've kind of got this, um, uh, you've got this fulcrum, I guess is like all the way on the left is, is the more transactional giving. And then the, on the other, not to say that a $20 gift from someone isn't meaningful to them, but I'm talking about what's more meaningful to and impactful for your organization. The mean, more meaningful gifts are gonna come from assets. Now, relationships, and this is Mark Knapp's relational model, which came out, I think I learned this actually in college in the uh, late 80s. Now you know how old I am. But the relational model um, is one that, and people have made different variations of this, but it makes a lot of sense. I mean, there's a coming together period, then, then you, you, you bond and you, you go into sort of a maintenance mode. And then if things change, then the relationship can stagnate and eventually come apart. Now, with transactional giving, that can be quite fleeting, especially considering what we saw was a 16% 16% retention rate, this is going to come apart very quickly. But with more meaningful gifts, that's going to be a much more long-term, elongated, and hopefully permanent relationship. This is, again, requires different staff and different mentality. And we can break this down looking through, through the, the, the both sides of this equation is that the objective of the organization in the transactional giving is more about like getting gifts and collecting charity or acquiring donors and getting money now to keep the lights on while the more meaningful objective uh, get the um, the objective for more meaningful giving is more uh, about building partnerships um, supporting the philanthropic decision making process uh, making sure that people retain and, and there's lifetime value and even uh, after lifetime value, so to speak. The, it, we're looking at short-term versus long-term, mass promotions versus very personalized and uh, value exchange, a win-win kind of exchange of value, a solicitous um, approach that sometimes involves premiums or gimmicks or tricks. Uh, I'll, I'll say, you know, testing different colors on envelopes and different messages and stuff uh, compared to trust building and engagement. Um, and again, value delivery, making sure that needs are met among the wealthier donors. This uh, again is, is the, the proximity of the, uh, the, the staff for transactional giving will be more arm's length while the meaningful uh, um, work is going to need to be more one-to-one. -one. And I like the word adjacent because we're partnering with people to work on this problem together. And that creates a, a, a more enduring and synergistic benefit for the organization compared with uh, immediate rewards that are somewhat self-satisfying for organization members and administrators. It's, it is very self-gratifying to generate gifts every day. If they're low dollar, it's, it feels good. Something is happening. But um, uh, the, the pace of the decision-making process is, it, while it's fast for the transactional giving, it's very slow and deliberate uh, among the meaningful giving. The transactional is more triv trivial, while the more meaningful is more consequential. And what Dr. James calls this in his books and in his research is uh, he, he proves, um, which I won't get into the science on this, but it is what he calls ele ele evolutionarily unstable is the transactional giving, while more meaningful and philanthropic giving is evolutionarily stable because it propels societies forward in, in, in more meaningful ways. That's what philanthropy, philanthropy means love. You know, that's what it's all about. So when you really line these up, 
what you're gonna see is conflict. This is creating conflict. Uh, you've got the major donor on, on one side who wants to be the hero in their life story and be seen as a hero and live on ever after in the minds of their loved ones and their community as the hero. And then you've got the organization leadership or administration and, and staff who also want to be the hero in their life story because they're working for an amazing organization doing amazing good on behalf of the donors who can't do this work or won't do it. They would rather be at their armchair and uh, just giving the money. So the problem with this is that you cannot have two heroes in any story. You just can't, it doesn't work. Meanwhile, you have the major gift officer, the legacy gift officer, they're sort of stuck between the two heroes because the gift officer generally doesn't want to be the hero of the story. They want to be the supporter, the counselor, the advisor, the sage. They want to help people as a guide. They're not looking for the credit, but uh, they are stuck between two that do want to be the hero, and that doesn't work. This actually is the essence of the problem that creates dysfunction. And this is why um, if the organization and an administration keeps their cape on, this is why too often well-meaning, amazing major gift officers and legacy gift officers are discredited. They're not listened to, they're treated as others, they're put in a corner. and. Sadly, they're scapegoated when the revenue doesn't come in as fast as the organization wants it to. Uh, but never forget that people give on their own timetables. They don't give on an organization's timetable. So um, that, that's the, the three golf balls that I, I, the way I see it. Again, you may see others and you may wanna break it down a different way, but I was trying to take a whole bunch of flying golf balls and just lay it out and try and understand, okay, what the heck is driving this silo mentality? So I, I hope this helps you at least understand the problem. Uh, what we need is functionality, remember? And that means you're gonna need to add some oil to this. Um, before I get to that, I'm going to pounce uh, a little bit on why we meet, need to fix the problem, you know, the urgency of this, and then we'll get into fixing the problem, and then we'll move on to wrapping up. So we've got to fix this problem because um, people are dropping out of giving entirely. Uh, in the past 18 years, well, in this report, came out recently, but it's, it only shows up until 2018. We went from two thirds of Americans were giving down to now just half of Americans are giving. There's also been research that people are less religious now. It kind of goes hand in hand because more religious people tend to give more, but um, it's just, this is a big, big problem and it's escalating. It's happening at a, at a greater rate. And the amount that people are giving on average is declining as well. Donors are not retaining. Uh, revenue retention is down. This is all from my fundraising report card. First time donor retention is going down. Reactivated donor retention is going down. <laughs> Repeat donor retention going down. This is a bad problem, you know? And as we said, the 80-20 rule is no longer in effect. This is a bad problem. I submit to you that the reason this is happening is because of distrust. And distrust is can be fixed if we solve the silo problem. Okay, so if you don't believe me about the distrust, I'm just going to show you this from, from this report, is that uh, trust is on the downside with older donors and younger donors. I believe it's because of the populist fundraising approach with interruption that involves a lot, too much interruption, too much annoyance, too much solicitation, too much of selling people's names or using data uh, that they didn't give permission for you to use. People are becoming less and less interested in this and doubling down on this is not going to get us any more trust. Um, the Edelman Trust Barometer showed that there's a big drop 
in recent years in this, especially among the informed public, which is tends to be the wealthier people. And in fact, uh, Edelman showed that businesses, private sector business is actually trusted more than nonprofits now, which really hadn't never happened uh, in, in all of their research on this. So uh, add to this that fundraising is getting more expensive, especially the low dollar fundraising and with the inflation and with the bottlenecks and supply chain, you know, the acquisition costs are increasing. Uh, it's hard to get envelopes. It's uh, the postage is increasing again. And again, printing is increasing. Um, staff salaries are increasing. And then there's recession that's looming and low dollar donors, if this if recession really hits, are going to sadly become unemployed and give less while the major donors will probably become wealthier. So I think there is urgency to fixing this problem. So let's jump into how to fix it. I'll tell you that um, you, you should start by checking your leadership. I mean, if your leadership is poor, there's not much you can do about it. It is a leader's job, and I can tell you firsthand, it's my job to create the vision, uh, lay out the core focus, your core values, and then hire the right people that, that align in this way and get them in the right seats. There's also, you could use my, my acronym that I made up uh, and added to recently. Some of you may have heard it before. I'm from New Jersey, so I'm a little crass, but I say, you got to give your people a lot of crap. It's easy to remember that way. It's clarity, resources, accountability, patience, and praise. I'm not going to go, I could do a whole webinar just on that, but I, I think that that's the reason why our score is fairly high is because I've been working on that. But if your leadership doesn't know how to do that, that's, that's a problem. So uh, you might actually want to look for another place to work if, it, if you can. All right, so number two is after you check your leadership is you've got to recalibrate hero stories. In other words, um, in, you got to, the only way to get rid of the conflict and the dis, dis, uh, dysfunction is if somebody will take off their cape, right? So it's not going to be the donors. It's got to be the organization and the administrators. They've got to stop puffing out their chest. They've got to recognize that they, they can be the hero in their own life story, in their own minds, but not elsewhere, especially not in competition with major donors. Don't do it. You won't win. They will not give money to your organization if you want to be the hero in the story. There can be only one hero. This is, in fact, the greatest point that I got from Dr. James's research is that they uh, organizational leaders, board members, um, program people, everybody's got to remove their cape in service to raising money. And that will help the major gift officers tremendously. Uh, once the cape is removed, then the idea is to focus on collaborating with donors. Major donors need collaboration they don't need solicitation, right? So um, this means though that the administrators and, and others need to respect fundraisers and the donors. And that's because the fundraisers are representing donor needs. So lay down your weapons. If you're not a fundraiser here, you know, lay down your weapons, appreciate and value the fact that your gift officers are the conduits. They are the translators for the donor needs and the organizational needs. And they, they need to, you need to listen to fundraisers, give them more voice, support their voice, let their voice be heard. Don't treat them as others because they're trying to negotiate and balance the needs of the organization with the needs of the individual asset givers. Um, help them, the organization, everybody in the organization should be looking for ways to help fundraisers deliver value to donors. If you don't like wealthy people or you don't like your donors, this is a problem. It means you should not be part of the organization or stay far away from fundraisers and donors. 
you've got to love these people. Philanthropy is all about love. So help the donors deliver value to the donors. Number four is take a federalist approach. This is striking right now because people are waking up to the fact that the Supreme Court is actually a separate but equal part of our government. We forget that, right? Ours is a federalist uh, constitution. You know, we are a republic but we, we are based on federalism, and then maybe this is a civics class for, for some, but uh, we need that also in our organizations. So in this respect, donors still, they maintain the power. I mean, money is power. To a point, we have gift acceptance policies. We should not accept gifts from, from donors that are being manipulative or want to change the core values or your mission. Of course, got to have that. Make sure that, that the needs of the community are being served without a doubt. But I'm just talking about internally, you've got to recognize, give the donor the power with, within reason and let the administrators maintain their authority. Fundraisers, meanwhile, need to be included and appreciated, not treated as others. Finally, you need to revise what metrics you measure. Uh, I could do a whole webinar just on this as well, but it's it breaks my heart when I see fundraisers um, being judged on um, activity metrics. They're stupid. Um, they show that you're doing activities, but they're not necessarily true. You want to focus on outcomes. So that means you want to look at pipeline size, the uh, how much is in the pipeline, and you want to create a weighted pipeline. Um, just Google that term. I don't have time to go over it today, but you also want to see the velocity through which deals are moving through the pipeline, and you want to remove uh, friction in the process for the donor by adding value. So the more value you supply to a donor, the more they will give and the faster they will do it. So if you focus on these metrics instead of activity metrics, which are relatively meaningless, they can be arbitrary anyway and unrealistic, and they, they could be developed just for the vanity of the person developing them to say, well, I got my gift officers done 10 visits a month or whatever. I mean, it doesn't matter if those aren't turning into a greater pipeline that's moving uh, faster and uh, resulting in major gifts. So, uh, and finally, eliminate scapegoating. If I hear a board member like get mad at, at a major gift officer one more time, I might slap them. You know, it's it's it is a team effort. Your gift officers are only as good as everybody who's also supporting them. So you've got to support your gift officers efforts and listen to them and let them be the conduits that they want to be. So that's my five points on how to fix the problem. I hope that's helpful for you. Of course, you can reach out to me and engage online. I'm happy to go much deeper into any of these. I probably could have done one webinar on each of these. I am gonna to get to your survey, the, the assessment results. But first I wanted to tell you that all of this that I've been describing is it much more densely discussed and described in our donor story, Epic Fundraising eCourse with Dr. Russell James. It's the only, online fundraising training course that helps fundraisers become better fundraisers, but also helps staff work more collaboratively together. That's the way this has been designed. It's a powerful, powerful training course. And again, you know it's, it's good because it's based on everything that it's based on Dr. James's research, which we already went over. It will tell fundraisers and teach them exactly what to say and what to do and why, according to science, what they should say and do works. It also discusses how to get everybody on the same page and rowing in the same direction in support of gifts of major assets. Um, these, this course helps provide uh, support for sector-wide challenges. In other words, people don't know what really works. There's too many myths, in my opinion, and old wives' tales and 
um, orthodoxies, traditions about what works, too many consultants saying what works when it doesn't really work, or it's just old, it doesn't work anymore. There's too many, uh, uh, too much friction and, and misunderstandings. These are the challenges that, that you're facing, I'm sure. And that's driving high rates of staff turnover. This course helps solve all those problems, those sector-wide challenges. And it is available now. In fact, it just uh, launched today. It's twice a year that we're, we're opening up registration at a discounted rate. So it's one low annual subscription with unlimited number of students, okay? It's not per student cost. You could see Cindy from MD Anderson said, it's been really helpful and I've already used the conversations with our team so they better understand it too. If you wanna build functionality, you've got to educate your team so they understand what people like Cindy do and what donors need. Um, in this course, you learn how to identify the top 13% that provide 88%. Of course, I did the math differently. I looked at 76% of the revenue coming from 0.7% of the donors. Uh, this is Dr. James's numbers. Uh, but it, you'll learn how to ensure that most of your gifts, 98%, will come without restrictions, which I know everybody wants. The organization wants that. The administration wants that. Board members want that you'll improve performance of every single gift officer without making them work harder. You'll find outliers, the super wealthy people that are uh, hiding in your database, but you can't find from wealth screening. And you'll learn to work, understand what words and questions really work. So you can build this um, culture of philanthropy and get the team working together to raise more money. It's Dr. James's research and theory and practical application for the raising of major gifts and legacy gifts. But when you apply these approaches, all levels rise, I promise you. Um, Gary says, this model of the hero story was a new way of thinking for me. I, same for me. I, I'll, I'll give all credit to Dr. James about that. So right now you got to think about, would this be beneficial for you and your team? You'll get um, a way to think of that is to see what you get. You get a, a lot of stuff, but um, it, it may be even too much, but don't worry about that. We'll talk about that in a second. You get uh, transcripts and audio downloads an online community that you can participate in. There's a discussion board you can post questions to and people will engage. Uh, there are monthly live Q&A sessions, mostly led by me, and sometimes Dr. James actually participates. You could see that Jill Nelson said she felt so privileged to participate in these. It's so nice to meet with wonderful people, and the team members are energized and positive. It, this is a huge benefit. I was even thinking separating this and making an, an extra cost, but uh, we won't. It'll be free and included, along with Dr. James's quizzes and worksheets, and there's 20 and a half credits that you could get if you take the course, uh, a whole bunch of study sheets. Now, if that seems overwhelming, you should know there is a fast track. And most people, in fact, take the fast track. Their leaders take the fast track, board members. It's a little more fun, less scientific, more engaging. Uh, the, the videos are brief. Uh, super brief, in fact, and there's cartoons. <laughs> uh, it only takes about two and a half hours, so it's about the length of a movie or maybe a ball game, and you can get two and a half CFRE credits um, from, from that. So even if you just take this, the fast track or give it to new employees as they roll in or new board members, that would be very valuable. It's a very easy user interface that's been designed um, of course, there's the, the, the market smart slides or mostly cartoons, I'm sorry, the fast track uh, slides, uh, or there's the deep dive sessions from Dr. James, which are a little more, uh, they're still fun, but a little bit more detailed. So, okay, I'm going to wrap this up by saying you have two options right now. In fact, think about it, con continue on the same path that you've been on and uh, not be that much further ahead with the dysfunction and such. Or you could commit to improving performance organization-wide and making the team a lot more collaborative and successful. Um, you get all this 
It be definitely beats the heck out of getting another degree. Thank you, Julie. And uh, there are, oh, three quick bonuses. There's a bonus where you will learn the words that work. This is partly in the training, but there's also this heavy bonus about exactly which words encourage planned giving, especially. There's a, uh, an extra bonus of Dr. James talking specifically about how to raise major gifts of assets and how you can land more meetings. That one's le led by me. Um, since I've made probably 30, 40,000 cold calls in my life, I know a thing or two about that. But you get all that included with the training. There's also a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you don't like it or feel like you made a mistake, you can um, return it. Thankfully, nobody's done that yet. Um, so yeah, you get all the bonuses. You get the fast track. You get the live monthly mastermind mixers that you can either participate in or not. This, we, 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 we added it all together and figured, well, this would be valued at about 2,600 bucks per person, but that's not what we're going to charge. In fact, um, the regular price is 1997, I'm sorry, per person, but we made it so it's not a per person thing. It's an organization wide subscription. And we also made it um, so that if you add an extra 25 bucks to get up to five people CFRE credits, then um, the price uh, for now, and only for a, a very short period of time, is $999. And that gets you unlimited access for your entire organization. We don't care how big, how small, uh, all your employees, volunteers, and board members can get the course. Um, it's really great for on-ramping new staff, uh, volunteers, especially board members, committee members and such. So even if just 10 people take it, then it's uh, only 9.99, which is like, I think you can't beat, or I, I'm sorry, $99, can't do math. But the offer ends on July 19th. Um, if you have budget left over, and I know it's the end of the month, you might wanna do it today. But if you have new budget coming up at the beginning of uh, July, then maybe you wait until July to do it. But it ends on July 19th at 3 p.m. Again, the way it works is it's uh, initially $9.99 to, to, to get the annual subscription. Then up to five people for an extra 25 bucks can, get the, um, uh, can also get the CFRE credits, 20 CFRE credits. And then once that's paid, then it's unlimited for your entire organization. I hope that makes sense. All right, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I'm gonna leave this on there um, with the URL in case you want to sign on. It should be in the chat as well. And it's also gonna be on our website. Just go to imarketsmart.com and click on the e-course there and you'll be able to um, sign up. All right, let's get to your assessment questions. Thanks for the crass commercial message there. Um, so there were seven questions that you all filled out. Uh, we, let's start with the first one. So this was, was interesting. It, it's another bell curve, just like the other one I showed all teams working at my organization, not just the fundraisers, recognize and agree that providing value to supporters is essential for building trusting relationships. I was a little disappointed that it's only somewhat, mostly somewhat true, really. And that, uh, but I think this is why there's a need for building functionality among staff is people need to understand what they need to do in support of delivering value to um, uh, donors, major gift donors, especially with assets through the conduit, which is the major gift officer. All right, so the next one was very disappointing, frankly, is that all teams, uh, we asked, all teams have a clear understanding of the process each donor undergoes as they consider making a consequential major gift of assets or a legacy gift. So this is heavily weighted towards the not true this is a problem, folks, because if the entire if all the teams don't understand this, then there's going to be pressure to generate inconsequential transactional low dollar gifts rather than pressure to support major donor decision making through supporting conduits and counselors and guides 
such as your major gift team. It's important that your team understands this process. Now, the course, of course, tremendously describes the process. I mean, in great detail and backed by science. It's indisputable, and I highly recommend people um, learning about it, not just fundraisers. The entire team needs to understand this so that they can support fundraisers and so they can take some pressure off of fundraisers, uh, especially with regard to making fundraisers ask for money before donors are ready and have allowed, per granted permission for that ask to occur. Um, all teams understand and accept the fact that most donor dollars come from major gifts and of assets and large legacy gifts, and that focusing on raising those gifts generates the most revenue at the lowest cost. This might upset some people, but they've got to understand that for the longevity of your mission, of your organization, to fulfill its promise to society, this needs to be understood. I was also disappointed that it was so heavily weighted towards uh, the definitely not true side here. Uh, but basically what we're finding is organizations are generally dysfunctional here <laughs> um, and, and not supporting what really needs to be supported. So here's another one. All teams adhere to a collaborative approach that involves separate but equal power among internal departments. As a result, input from fundraisers and donors is accepted with the same weight as input from administrators and other insiders. And we have that regular, more, more um, uh, familiar bell curve, fairly leaning towards the definitely not true, which I, is, is disappointing. And then finally, I think this is the last one, is that all teams recognize and agree that a fundraiser's job involves operating as a champion for and provider of donor value, as well as translator for donor needs. And we can see it's pretty lukewarm response here. Um, not that exciting, not, um, yeah. And this is the one uh, that we looked at earlier in the uh, um, event. All teams are working together to make sure that fundraisers are not treated as others or discredited. And um, this was better than I, I had thought, but uh, still not uh, exactly great. Oh, sorry, there is one more. All teams work together to report back to donors so they continue to recognize the value they gain through their philanthropic contrib contributions. This was disappointing because I didn't, we didn't get any. Now, remember, this is a very low number of people. Maybe by the time we do our third uh, episode of this event, it'll be higher. But um, yeah, so we only have really one minute left. It, I, I will stick around for questions now. That concludes our presentation though. And I hope that was helpful. Um, let's see, so I'm gonna open this up and, and feel free to type in questions. If I don't see any, let's look in the chat here. Okay, I'm seeing some things in the chat here. And maybe my, maybe Trisha, if you wanna feed them to me or I'll go up here. Okay, bear with me folks. Super helpful. Oh, good. Uh, most of the questions actually surrounded the availability of the webinar video and deck. And yes, we will definitely be sending that out to folks. Um, All right, cool. Another um, question from yeah. Rachel is, do we have a list of sessions that are particularly valuable for non-fundraisers to tune into? Yes. In fact, we can work with you on that to sort of procure that. And we would love to collaborate. Like if you're taking the course now, Rachel, or if you decide to take the course, we actually have been hearing about this and would love to work with you on procuring that kind of list of which videos and sessions would be most valuable for the non-fundraisers so that they don't have to take the whole course. Yeah. Curation is what I'm basically talking about. Yep. So uh, Beverly says, love this way of thinking about metrics. Glad, I'm, I'm glad you like that. And Rachel, thank you. Rachel, uh, I know you can't talk, but I wonder if you do have, if you already are in the course, just let us know. And uh, I, in fact, I personally would be happy to work with you on that. 
So the slides have been shared. I don't see any questions about really anything else. So um, yeah, I guess that'll conclude today's presentation. I really hope you got something out of that. I know I went fast that I could do a whole day presentation on leadership and, and such, but um, look, we, time is short. So thank you all for um, attending. It was really great having you all here and uh, have a great weekend. Be safe.